Do we have any adjustments to the agenda? It's just a, a professional meeting. So, um, <clears throat> is there any board comment? All right, then we'll just move into our budget informational presentation. Um, do you have the slideshow to? Oh, there we go. All right. So we're just going to start with some introductions. Um, Andrew Jones, I'm the chair of the White River Unified District Board. So let me go around and introduce. I'm sorry, but you're going to have to speak up. I can't hear you. Okay. I have hearing aids. <laughs> I'm Andrew Jones. I'm the chair of the White River Unified District Board. Um, we're going to go around and introduce ourselves. Uh, Chris Jarvis, um, representative from Bethel on the board. Peggy Ainsworth from Royalton. Nancy Pageway from Bethel. Andrew Bowen, elementary principal. Jeff Thomas, high school principal. Thanks for coming. Kara Weatherell, the business manager. I'm Pierre Laflamme. I'm the middle school principal over in the Bethel campus. And um, Jamie Canarney is joining us. Yeah, my apologies. I'm virtual this evening. It's great to be with everyone tonight. We've got a couple other. Ed Sullivan and Rodney Rainville are, are also board members who are joining us virtually. Um, Okay, so just before we get into this year's budget, we're just going to quickly go over what happened in um, FY23. That was last year's budget that's complete. We've got the audit at this point. Um, and we did really well that year um, financially. We uh, wound up basically with a $759,000 surplus over the previous over uh, budget versus expenses. Um, or revenue versus expenses for the year. Um, part of the reason that it's different than what we budgeted for was we were receiving um, COVID relief funds that were able to supplement our um, our offset some of the expenses that were budgeted for. Um, and when we were doing uh, using the COVID relief funds, we made um, kind of a conscious decision not to add positions that would be ongoing positions that would increase the budget once the money for them was gone um, and tried to use them for short-term expenses that we could, um, you know, use uh, that wouldn't add to the budget long-term. So, and it also was able to offset some of the expenses that were in the budget. So that's one of the reasons why we had a fair amount of Surplus, at the end of the year, we have an audited surplus of $997,000. Um, and so we then need to decide with surplus funds, you can either use them to lower taxes in the current or the upcoming budget or put them aside to the capital improvement fund. And what we're going to be asking is that we put those aside for the capital improvement fund since we have some um, building expenses coming up that we'll talk about a little bit later. Um, the other thing on this slide is just that the capital improvement fund balance coming into this year is 1.2 million. We've been able to put aside pretty substantial amounts the previous couple of years. So it's at a pretty healthy place right now, which is a good thing to be in. So kind of our current financial status going into this budget season is pretty good. Uh, so looking at this upcoming budget, um, the changes to the current budget, um, we're maintaining the current staffing and adding a few positions that'll help serve our students um, going forward. So one is uh, one FTE, which is full-time equivalent staff um, for middle and high school tech education. There's a 0.4 increase to reading and math interventionists to allow us to have a full-time math interventionist at the middle school. Um, we're, we would like to add a social worker to provide wraparound support services to students and families. Um, there's a student support coordinator for the elementary campus and uh, an administrative assistant support on um, the guidance services. Um, this is the guidance counselor and, and college readiness services for um, 
our students and you know we feel like we could better support those students by adding an extra position there um there's some one-time money in in this budget for purchasing elementary math um materials to um transition to a new math program for the elementary um, student uh, schools. And there's also some money for transportation services uh, provided by Tri-Valley Transit to supplement our, um, our existing busing services for students accessing after-school programming and um, also for transportation for tuitioning students that aren't normally served by our normal buses. And if I could, just one thing I just want to just interject so you kind of understand the whole picture of why we, you know, so most of the positions that we have added are really because the school is growing. So our, our could you speak up a little bit more, please? A majority of these services that we have added to the budget this year is, is not just because we want to add them, but it's because <coughs> our campuses are growing in population wise. So, um, you know, three or four years ago, when we first started White River Valley, because we had a few bumps in the road along the way, as we all know, uh, that it wasn't really the place to be, but it has, over the last couple of years, started to be the place to be. So, I mean, we literally have a bunch of students that come from Randolph this year that are here at the school. So we're, so we're starting to add services that to, um, to be able to build that, that population that we have, as, as well as during the COVID years, uh, when we were remote teaching, we had identified that there was there was a group of students um, that were or were challenged um, by with some of the test scores, um, and it was more in the middle school area. So that's why we um, are trying to get that extra help for for the middle school um, with those extra positions um, that we have there, as well as I think we all know that you know there's a lot of mental health challenges that are out there right now, and that that definitely uh, impacts our student population. So you know. Um, getting that extra support in the school is, is something that we added. So, yeah. So, talking about some of those uh, positions um, more specifically, the tech education um, position. The current staff splits time between the high school and the middle school, um, and it was felt like we needed more support on both campuses. Um, there's a new middle school makerspace that was one of the one-time expenses that we used the COVID money for was to produce like a great um, state-of-the-art uh, makerspace for the middle school and having a staff member there who can learn how all that works and be able to support our students with it um, will really help with that and um, there's an increased demand for tech education as we have been expanding the flexible pathways program this is this allows students to get school credit for things in non-traditional classroom settings where they can do project work and receive, you know, very great learning experiences and receive credit for it. And, you know, the tech education is a good part of that. Um, so we're increasing staffing on that to support those programs. Um, the student support coordinator, we're adding one extra. The student support coordinators provide behavioral support and interventions um, for students you know, that have trouble regulating behaviors or things like that. So, um, you know, providing more support there allows there to be a more consistent presence uh, and availability at both elementary campuses and um, will help maintain positive learning environments for our students in the classrooms. Um, and the final one I want to talk about was the social worker. Um, the goal of the social worker is to provide wraparound supports for families. Um, there's a lot of families that are eligible for services that they aren't currently accessing and having staff that can help support families in accessing the services and resources that they're eligible for um, will hopefully lead to stronger home situations that can help children or students come to school prepared to learn so we're you know hoping that providing that that support will will help in that regard so to look at the budget on the whole, um, the spending we're proposing is a total of fourteen million three hundred eighty-two thousand dollars, and or three hundred eighty-two and ninety-three dollars. So it's uh, increase of one million four hundred thirteen dollars. 
Um, the revenue is basically the same as, as what we projected last year. Um, we like to be conservative on um, the revenue projections for tuition students and things like that so that you know if we do receive more than what we've projected it's it's you know better than receiving fewer and then winding up in a deficit situation um, so the net spending uh, the act 68 education spending is up 1.4 million dollars um, the student number the long-term weighted average this is something that's changed this year previously it was the equalized pupil number but because of a law that was passed Act 127, they changed the calculation for that. And we'll look at that more specifically um, in upcoming slides. But from what it would have been last year if they were using the current calculation to what it is this year, we've gained 64 long-term weighted average pupils, um, which is good. You know, having an increased student population helps with, um, with the tax rate and everything. Um, so the per pupil spending, uh, that we're proposing is $11,950. That's an increase of $629. <clears throat> Looking at the change in spending, you know, that $1.4 million does is a big number. Um, and it's kind of shocking to look at it. But when we break it down, you know, we have those new positions that we're proposing and we feel like they're important things that will really help us provide positive learning environment for our students. Um, and that comes out to about $434,000 for those positions. And then the one-time spending that we have in there is $51,000. The remaining almost a million dollars is just based on cost increases. So um, I forget the exact percentage of the healthcare is up. 16.7. Yes. Healthcare costs are up 16%. Um, you know, it includes just uh, contracted staff raises and everybody knows how inflation has been the last couple of years so you know these are kind of costs that are outside of anything that we're you know kind of offering they're just the way budgets go these days um so that's how we get to the 1.4 million <coughs> all right so act 127 was a bill that was passed a couple of years ago and it's uh, goal was to improve equity across Vermont schools by adjusting the school funding formula. It also provides some educational quality and funding oversight, but what's kind of relevant to this um, budget discussion is um, how they changed the equalized pupil calculation into the long-term weighted daily membership calculation. So on the left, I realize it's a little small, but you can see the uh, the previous weights for students. And on the right, you can see what they have for new weights. And essentially what they did was they provide more support for schools that are serving middle and high school level, since it costs more to educate those students. Um, they provide a big bonus for districts that have um, high poverty levels or students that are below the poverty level and um, for multilingual learners and then they also provide extra support for districts that are um, sparsely populated so rural districts or small schools um, and looking at how that came out for us next slide, um, we wound up benefiting from this uh, in the previous calculation, our equalized pupils of 566.94 was 0.67% of the state total equalized pupils. With the new calculation, our long-term weighted average daily membership is 0.77% of the state total. So that's an increase in our percent of the state share of 14%. And that basically is, is lowering our taxes or giving us more resources to invest in our schools. So. This was a good good bill for us. Now there were some um, kind of uh, growing pains with this bill in that when they first passed it, they didn't want to have towns that were adversely impacted by the changes in the um, in the calculations have to bear the full brunt all in one year. You know, there are some districts that were getting thirty or forty percent change in what they were having to, to um, you know, 
their tax rate calculations and they didn't want to have that all in, come in just one year. So they were trying to phase it in over, over a five year period and the way that they were did it initially was that they gave districts a 5% tax rate cap where their increase in taxes couldn't be more than 5% as long as their spending was less than 10%. The downside to this was if a district was above that 5% tax rate cap, then there wasn't any downside to increasing their spending up to that 10% cap. So it led to districts adding extra spending into their budgets because they could with no financial penalty. But that money had to come from somewhere and it comes from the education fund. And in order to raise that money, they were needing to increase taxes on all the districts that were below the cap. Of course, that pushed more districts above the 5% cap and you know, kind of led to an unsustainable cycle. So um, over the last couple of weeks and month or so, they um, quickly have worked on a fix for that. Um, that's House Bill 850. Um, and that was just passed, was it just signed last week by the governor? And so that removes the 5% tax cap and provides a fixed rate discount um, for the towns that are adversely affect, affected and that'll slowly phase out over the five years. Um, but the fact that now the tax, you know, the towns that are over the tax don't receive any, you know, can, if they added spending, they're probably going to remove it so they don't have the adverse tax effect. And also, you know, the towns that were at that 5% or above 5% before didn't have any incentive to lower their um, tax uh, spending because lowering the spending wouldn't have done anything either. So we expect that this result will result in reduced spending across the state, which will hopefully lower our taxes as a result. So this was another benefit for our district. So just as a quick review, um, the final tax rate that we wind up seeing on our property tax bills, um, to get that we take the spending and subtract out the revenue and divide that by our long-term weighted average pupils to get the per pupil spending. That per pupil spending is divided by the state yield to get the equalized tax rate. And then our final rate is the equalized tax rate divided by the common level of appraisal. We'll talk about a couple of those steps in a little more detail in these next couple slides. So the yield is that state factor that the state <coughs> changes to um, the, to determine how much money they're raising from the towns. So an increased yield decreases our taxes, a decreased yield increases our taxes. And they um, it's the factor to convert between per pupil sp spending and the equalized tax rate. <clears throat> so in normal years, they provide us a projection for the uh, projected yield on December 1st, and we got one of those this year. Um, but because of the uncertainty with Act 127 and all this, you know, kind of budget, um, the unanticipated extra spending people were doing. In January, they gave us a, a different projected yield that was um, lower than what it had been. So that was going to result in higher taxes. And then as this H850 was coming about, they put out another projected yield um, with the anticipated changes, um, what they were expecting that to do to the yield. So we wound up with this kind of shifting yield and it was a difficult budget season this year because we kind of had these shifting goalposts as far as what our spending would result in as far as the final tax rate. Um, and of course, we still don't really know since the final tax rate will depend on the yield that's passed by the legislature prior to the close of the <coughs> session. So until they finalize that yield, we don't know for sure what our final tax rate will be. But at this point, I, I think we have more certainty about it than we did going through the process. Um, so just to look at the impact of, of what those different projections were, um, with the December 1st letter, with the spending that we're proposing, our equalized tax rate was going to be 1.2643, which was a 7.43 cent reduction compared to last year's equalized tax rate. The January revised projection um, wound up increasing that by four cents and 
then the February one wound up uh, is projected to be an 11 cent reduction compared to last year. So, I mean, I think at this point we're kind of expecting it to be around that February number, but we're going to have to wait and see what winds up, how, how different towns react to the changes and what it does to their spending and how it winds up working out statewide. Um, the final thing that wound up coming in uh, towards the end of our budget process was the common level of appraisal. And um, this is a factor that the town um, compares the town appraised values to recent actual sale prices of properties. And um, it's what converts the equalized tax rate to a final tax rate. The state uses this because, you know, the town, each town can have different appraised values and do appraisals at different times. They try and use this factor to kind of get a real <coughs> property value that they assess us on as opposed to this assessed value. Um, so the fact that property values have been increasing over the last couple of years um, has led to the yield dropping pretty significantly <coughs> in Bethel. So, you know, as we're reaching the end of our um, budget process, the CLA came out and we wound up seeing that there's a 10% decrease in Bethel, which, you know, really impacts the tax rate there and a seven and a half percent decrease in <coughs> Royalton, which also, you know, like we were feeling pretty good about the equalized tax rate decreases we were seeing and this kind of, um, the change in the CLA really kind of wiped those out for the most part. <coughs> Um, and this is just a graph of like what's been happening with the common level of appraisal. So it's been going down. We, we expect that there'll be a reappraisal over the next couple of years and uh, that'll have the common level appraisal go back up, which will lower our tax rates, but will be taxed on higher property values. So the overall value doesn't, well, our overall tax payments won't really change. <clears throat> Um, so here's just a quick summary of, of how that all works out. I'm mostly going to be just looking at that February yield side, the green uh, numbers. So our per pupil spending was up $629. Um, and with the February projected yield, that's uh, an 11 cent decrease in our equalized tax rate. And again, the equalized tax rate is what we like. If, if property values all stayed the same, then we would be looking at an 11 cent tax decrease. But because of the <coughs> CLA change, um, the taxes are increased by 2.4 cents or 2.5 cents in Bethel and decreased in Royalton uh, by 2.1 cents. And at the bottom, it shows for different value houses what that translates into for actual dollars on the final um, final tax bill. So for like a hundred thousand dollar house, that'd be twenty-four dollars and sixty-three cents in Bethel or a twenty-one dollar thirty cent decrease in Royalton. Um, this is just looking at how we compare it to some of our surrounding districts. So um, you know as I said most of the increase in our budget is fixed costs and not really, or, um, you know, cost increases. And all the other districts around us are dealing with those cost increases too. So that's why pretty much all the districts are in that 10% range for increase in, um, in spending. Um, but we were one of the beneficiaries of this Act 127. So our 10% increase results in a 8.29% decrease in our equalized tax rate, whereas Hartford is really looking at a pretty difficult situation where they have a 10% change in their budget and it's a 37% increase in their equalized tax rate. So we are somewhat, you know, we're, we're benefiting from this bill and in a relatively good position compared to a lot of our surrounding districts. Um, so this last slide was just looking at what is under kind of our local control versus what isn't. And generally what we as a school board can control is the budget that we're setting. 
Um, and that includes the general budget, which 80% of which is um, salaries and benefits for employees. So there's not kind of a lot other than positions to cut or you know, modify. And then there's whatever capital spending we do, and that's the total budget. And that winds up getting um, offset by non-tax revenues, which are things like tuition students and grants. And we have some control over those. You know, We can make our school more attractive for these students and try and attract more of them, but we don't quite have direct control over that. You know, we do the best we can to make it an appealing place. But all the other factors that we've been talking about, like the long-term weighted average daily membership, and the, that's more demographic factors, which are somewhat outside our control, and the property do dollar yield is set at the state level. We have very little control of that, and the common level of appraisal is housing property level trends. And so, you know, it just shows that while we try and, and, and I think we've done a pretty good job this year, um, partially aided by that Act 127, you know, we try and keep tax rates level and do what we can to make things reasonable budgets. You know, a lot of it is outside what we have under our purview. All right, to um, look at what the uh, articles are on the um, at the annual meeting, um, these first seven articles, which are on the warning, are uh, are kind of the boilerplate um, articles that we do every year. Um, we elect a moderator, we elect the school district clerk, we elect the school district treasurer. Um, article four is to hear the school district officer reports, so that'll be a presentation similar to this one. Um, probably with some more informational about slides about kind of what things are happening in the schools um, as opposed to just the budget. Um, and then the Article 5 is setting the school district offer salaries. That's how much money we get for being on the school board. Um, Article 6 is a school district treasury salary. And Article 7 is to allow the district to borrow money in advance of revenue. Since a lot of the payments that we get are you know, in November, but we need to start paying salaries in July or August. And so we need to be able to pay those salaries before we get revenue in. And this allows us to do that. Article eight is the article that we vote on the budget amount. So um, you vote yes for this if you approve the budget, no if you want to vote it down. Um, and that can be amended that night, right? Yes, yep. that can be amended that night. Um, Article 9 is where we, um, where the voters approve um, an amount to put into the Capital Improvements and Maintenance of Facilities Fund. As I said at the beginning, we have a $997,000 audited surplus from FY23, and we either use that money to lower the tax rate this year or to put it aside for future building needs. Um, and we're asking that we put as much as we can into the um, building reserve fund. Um, and what we currently have for building reserve funds is um, the audited balance from FY23 is the 1,441,000. Um, in FY24, we did some building work. Um, these were projects that were using, there were projects that provided energy savings. So this was lighting on both campuses. The, um, you replace the Bethel boiler with a wood pellet system. And there's also some heating and ventilation improvements. And these all provided cost savings for energy savings. And so there was a bond that was put out using that cost savings to um, fund these projects. So it was about $2 million worth of work. And all we wound up, like we wound up having to contribute some from the capital reserve fund because the bond rates wound up going up higher than was anticipated at the beginning. But for $2 million worth of work, we wound up doing it um, just $181,000 out of the capital projects reserve fund. Um, just to clarify, lease, not bond. Lease, not bond. Sorry. Yes, lease. Sorry. Yes, no vote required. <laughs> um, 
each year we transfer we we have a standing budget item that transfers some money into the capital reserve fund so even when we don't have surf surpluses we're still putting aside money for building maintenance needs um so that's what that forty thousand dollars is and then if we approve this article that would add nine hundred thousand dollars to it leading us leaving us with two million two hundred thousand dollars now the first batch of um, projects that we did were all the projects that basically paid for themselves from the energy savings we have a next batch of projects which don't have energy savings associated with them so this is where we actually need to spend money to have things happen um, and the main highlight of that would be a performing arts center expansion project this would be adding space uh, next to the um, old gym old elementary gym in this campus to provide a, a practice space for our burgeoning music and arts programs, um, like the drama and, and music programs. Um, the, we're really kind of pushing the space that we currently have down in the basement here, and there's um, a need for expansion of that, or a need for new space for that program. And the music boosters have done a really great job of, of working with um, the putting together this uh, proposed project and uh, raising money for it. And um, so that would be the kind of big chunk of money for this would be adding that expansion. And um, the other projects that are important and we would like to do at the same time, um, one is to modify or renovate our entrances in Bethel and Royalton to be up to modern standards as far as security and um, and yeah, mostly security. And the main one on this campus would be the high school entrance, which is around back and currently is just a single door where you're walking into or directly into the building. And so this would be making it so that it has double doors that can be you can let people in, have them see them and then allow them access to the rest of the building. Um, through that back entrance. Um, there's also this library currently doesn't have adequate ventilation or really any ventilation. So, um, and over the last couple of years, we've really found the or learned the benefits of proper ventilation for health and wellness. So adding uh, ventilation upgrades to this room. Um, wasn't there a cafeteria ventilation upgrade included in that too? So it would also be for the cafeteria in here. Um, and upgrades to um, the gymnasium performance space to make that a better performance space. Um, and Jamie, you had something you wanted to add? Yeah, I apologize. I worked on the slide. What's I also missing? Is, what's also oh. missing is um, there's some drainage issues that we need to take care of as well from the original gymnasium. That's part of that 5.2 million. Um, figure um and that that got left off this this chart so i apologize for that if you're adding up the math at home that's why it's it's not quite accurate we'll get that fixed for next monday yeah so that would be drainage out in the back parking lot um so that's a fairly big project um this is some renderings of what it might look like i don't it's certainly not finalized um, yet as far as what the actual plans would be. Um, with that $5 million total, um, the Music Boosters have been working on getting additional kind of private donations and um, funding to do a chunk of that. Um, we have a lot of that money from the Building Reserve Fund. We like to use a chunk of that. And um, we are hoping to go out for a bond um, this fall to do the remainder, looking at in the two two million dollar range for that um the way like we're our um current bond that we have for this uh south royal gym is going to be expiring in i think it's five years um and so this bond will really start would really start kicking in once that one expires so we really wouldn't be impacting our budgets significantly with this proposed um, addition 
and renovations. Um, so the final article is for the election of members of um, for the board of directors. Uh, there are two seats up for election. There is uh, one seat in Royalton um, for a three-year term expiring in 2027. Peggy is running for that, is on the ballot for that um, seat. And in Bethel, there's a three-year term as well. And there currently is nobody on the ballot for that. Um, the vote uh, for the school director positions is via Australia ballot on Tuesday, March 5th, beginning 8 a.m. and ending at 7 p.m. at both the Bethel and Royalton campuses. And if you have absentee ballots, they need to be turned into the polling places by 7 p.m. on March 5th. So um, that's all we have as far as our presentation at this point. Um, we welcome any uh, questions people have. Um, everybody should have received a budget mailer in the, that has all the line-by-line -line things um, in the I mail. I talked to someone who didn't. Oh, really? Ted and Bonnie said they didn't get there. Okay. Well, if you haven't received one, let us know, and we can certainly get you one, either digital or printout copy. Um, Check in with the town clerk to make sure the updated voter registry has the right addresses. I actually have two, so uh, if you want this one, you can have this one. Um, so, are there any questions anybody has? Yeah, I heard you say that there were some students who you know, being added and a bunch of students and all this stuff, but you haven't given us any real numbers as far as what the actual student count is, not the enhanced student. Yeah. It should be right on the top of the student. principal report, actually, the total student members. So in the, in the mailer, on the top of the principal report. And I had, um, uh, in 2021-22, we had 173 students, 9 through 12. 2022 to 23, we had 193. And this year, as of uh, today, we have 216 students. So it's an increase of uh, 43 students in two years in the high school. Yeah, so you can see the enrollment numbers for all the different schools <clears throat> on page seven of the uh, mailer. It doesn't have for previous years, but it has um, this year's numbers. What page was that? Uh, page seven. So it sounds like we're getting um, some students from Randolph. Yeah. yeah. And so do we, we pay transportation for that? Is that what I was understanding from your original from the beginning of the? Um, no, the Tri Valley Transit would be for sending. Um, why don't we have Jamie talk about this? He knows better about those routes. But. Yeah. Thanks, Andrew. So. Just so folks know, we're we're estimating an increase of tuition paying students just at the high school level of an additional 19. Um, we did not budget fully for all 19 in the revenue in the event that some change their mind. So that's good news. And those are coming from school choice districts, um, primarily within our supervisory union. Um, in regards to Randolph, they're able to attend our school through something called Winooski Valley School Choice. Um, there's actually statewide school choice at the secondary level. Um, and the board every year provides the amount of students they allow to come in to a district and how many they'll allow to go out. And so the students that are attending our school right now via Randolph are coming to us via Winooski Valley School Choice. No money switches hands. Um, and we do not provide transportation for those students to come. They have to find that transportation on their own. Great, thank you. And you'll have a question. Okay, Bob. Um, actually, I'll cover it. The state projected a 18% increase in property taxes. And they asked the schools to help them to reduce that. So have we done anything to help reduce that? Um, no. I mean, you can see that our property taxes aren't going up by that much. Um, and certainly, yeah, I, part of the reason that they passed the law was to provide support for districts like ours. 
And so, you know, I don't think that they were the purpose or the goal was to have us cut funding or positions in order to save property taxes around the state. You know, like I think, you know, our goal as the board is to provide reasonable tax rates for our taxpayers, but also provide support for our students. And, you know, the budget that we're proposing is what we think is most appropriate to provide the education our students need. So, you know, I don't, I, I don't think we had a goal of lowering taxes elsewhere as part of our curriculum. So, and I share on two boards, so sometimes I have a little more information, but so what, um, so the governor had obviously a snap, you know, he, he got his information before all of us, right? So, um, so this was several months ago, he started talking about, you know, 15 to 20% increases in taxes. And those were divided up in three things. One, um, they, they had kind of surveyed the towns on what, what the towns were thinking that their budget increases might be. Um, the second piece was the governor was uh, taking into account the effects on on the um, on the new waiting at the school that we just talked about, the Act 127. And then the third piece was the governor talking with the tax department about how the common level of appraisals across the state of Vermont were going down, which would affect, in this case, it affects mostly the school's budgets because they're most impacted by common level of appraisal. So that was kind of where those um, we'll call averages came from. And as you can see, <clears throat> some districts or some towns are, you know, that is there, you know, um, I mean, an example, an example of that was the town of Hartford. I mean, uh, you know, they have a 37% increase in their potential increase at the school level. And I'm sure they have a town level increase as well. Right. Um, I will say that I don't know as much in the Royalton end, but on the Bethel end, I mean, we, we are looking at, at this point, you know, a, a two cent increase in school potentially, and then a about a three cent increase on the town. So it's five cents. So it's, you know, much less than the, the 15, 18% that we'll say the average Vermonter may be looking at. Um, and then it looks like Royalton, you're at a two cent reduction at the school level. I don't know what the town is looking at at this point, but um, I mean, um, the other thing I would say is the other thing that's contributing to that increase was the uh, COVID funds going away. And a lot of districts put positions into their, they use that money to hire people that then they have to keep paying from their budgets. We didn't do that. So, you know, I think we didn't do anything this year to lower taxes, but I think that we proactively works to avoid being in the situation where we would have to like increase our budget this year because we wouldn't have those federal funds coming in. So, you know, I, I think we have looking at a longer term view. I think that we've been trying to budget responsibly and, you know, no, I don't say you haven't budgeted responsibly. I think you have, but, but I think the whole state's in trouble and I think in each individual school should do what they can. Well, I mean, if you look at the drivers of the cost increases, though, again, looking at that other slide, it's mostly not <clears throat> things that were like, we're not adding like, I mean, I guess you could say that the tech position or something is like surplus or, you know, like not essential, but like most of it is healthcare increases and things that aren't something that the schools should be solving. It should be solved at the state or federal level. And it's not really, you know, like, I don't think because healthcare costs are going up, we should cut teachers and educate our students less. You know? I don't think you should cut teachers either. Yeah. But I've made a lot of high school budgets in my life, and I noticed that there's places in this budget that there's extra money. And the only people that know it are um, probably the business manager and the superintendent. Um, but I'd go along with your budget and everything that you've asked for. I'm just asking if, if you've done anything to help reduce the cost of our budget and helping the state to meet their goals. 
18% tax, property tax is going to be tough on everybody. I just yeah. want to, I don't know how many of you looked at the town report, um, but this, um, this really shocked me. Um, in 2023, there were $311,483 of delinquent taxes. That figure is usually sits right around 20,000 or 30,000. And when it's finally collected, it's gone down to 12 or 1,400. That's an unbelievable figure to me. And that, that just tells me that the people in this town are having a hard time paying their taxes. It isn't that they don't want to. I think they're just having a hard time doing it. And um, when this town report was printed, um, the tax collector had collected 151,000. There's still 192,000 outstanding. Now she probably collected some of that since then. But when you when you think about the difference between 20 and 30,000 and 300,000 or 200,000 that people aren't able to pay because they're probably trying to put food on the, on their kid on their kids' plate and eat in their homes. And yet, if they don't pay those taxes in a year, their properties go up for a tax sale. So if you have a property that's worth three to thousand and it and it's worth eight thousand or eight thousand you pay eight thousand in taxes, let's say, um, it goes up for tax sale and you still can't pay the eight thousand, you you lose your three hundred thousand dollar home for eight thousand dollars. And I think you know, some of that is getting out of control for people. <clears throat> so, I'm, you know, I just hope that if I were in your position, I would do my best to lower the taxes for the people in this town because they're obviously having a hard time paying. Yeah, no, are you? And you're not the only I mean, the town, the town tax and the school tax. But some attention has to be paid to those people that are having a hard time paying their taxes. And it's, and it's obvious that it's, but that number of people has increased tenfold. So, I mean, I, <clears throat> but I, I, I mean, not to do politics, but I mean, I would, I would say that based upon the numbers you saw this evening, that we have been responsible. I mean, you're looking at in your town, you're looking at a two cent reduction on your tax rate at the school level than you did last year, right? Yeah, but so, I'm, what I'm seeing is it doesn't matter that we're getting that because the number of people who can't pay their taxes right. has gone up ten times in this town. But what I'm saying is, how how would that be the school's responsibility for that? You, the you're school part of it. Okay, but we're you're seeing a reduction on the school taxes land. go to, to the school, right? Exactly. Right, but if the, the if the taxes haven't changed, changed, if the tax rate hasn't changed, basically people are un, less able to afford it, and that's more of a you know society wide issue than a school specific issue. And you know, if we're looking long term, the goal should be to provide a good education so that you know. It, this is, I think that this is kind of a bigger issue than what we can deal with at the school level. You know, I agree. We we definitely take take tax rates into consideration, and we try. Like that's part of why we're taking this long term view of not adding extra spending when there was the COVID relief money. Um, you know, we we specifically looked at that and said we don't want to add positions so that we're not dealing with a tax rate increase later. And when we did have that extra money coming in, we put it into the building reserve fund so that when there was expenses like needing to add ventilation in this library, which is, you know, something that's really needed, or you know, securing our building entrances, which again is kind of like somewhat something that's pretty important these days, you know, we'd be able to do that without having a sudden increase in, in tax rate. Um, so, you know, we're trying to maintain a consistent and and predictable tax rate rather than, you know, like we had seven hundred thousand dollars that we put into the building reserve fund last year. We could have just taken that out of the, um, you know, we could have used that to lower taxes eight cents last year 
And then it would have just gone right back up this year. So you wind up with these seesawing tax rates. And I think that that is a harder thing to deal with than just providing kind of temporary relief. That, Andrew, I'm not being critical. No, I understand. Okay. I, I, I've spent 30 years in education. <laughs> I've, I've served on the board, uh, yep. you know, probably six years of my life. And I've served as a selectman uh, three years of my life in this town. But I, I have a genuine feeling for the people who have lived here um, and have raised their kids here and now are trying to just survive. Yeah. And I'd like to, and I'd like to see, I'd like to think that when we make these budgets and we ask for money, that we're doing it, you know, that we're thinking about that. Yes, um, and I don't mean to sound like reflexively defensive or something like that. I'm just trying to explain that we are, we do take into consideration, you know, try and serve all the constituents, you know, well, like, and this taking a an long view is kind of our way to do this that. This is an exceptional time. $300,000 worth of unpaid taxes. Yeah. 10 times what it usually is. And, yes. you know, and, that, and, and I'm just saying that these people are having a hard time paying their taxes. It isn't that they don't like education and they love it here. And, and uh, you know, they've always supported it. Yeah. I mean, I, it, you know, and I, and I think now, it, you know, for some people, it's very, very hard. Yeah. No, I, we definitely hear that and are aware. Um, one thing I would point out is it's been an exceptional time also for the students and, you know, like remote learning and the COVID disruptions really did put a strain on the system. And so that's partially why, like, you know, we did add some spending, add some positions, and partly it is to support the students that are having a hard time with these, you know. So, yeah, I mean, our job here is to kind of weigh all these different things and come out to the best thing that we can come up with. And that's what we try and do. And, you know, we definitely do hear that people are hurting out there and, and do try and avoid. And there's one other thing I would ask is... Um, hey, Bob, why don't you hold your question just because a okay. lot other people... I think Jamie has his hand up too. Um, yeah, you might have Jamie... No, he's... Provides what I, I just wanted to speak to, I think one of the things the governor was calling on uh, Bob was a lot of districts were spending up to a 10% ceiling within Act 127 because their tax rates were capped. And so the way that law worked is as long as your per pupil spending was under 10%, you could, you could benefit from a tax rate cap. And it allowed some districts in the state, I know of one, that budgeted three bond payments ahead of time. That was excess spending. So I think when the governor was saying to look at budgets, he was looking at folks that were utilizing that cap in a way that it wasn't designed to be used. And that's why they quickly uh, came out with HH50, which removed the cap um, and provided a, a transitional uh, decrease in taxes for those districts that lost tax capacity. But, you know, he's asking district boards to amend their budgets. Um, and I think he was asking those district boards that were not utilizing that cap the way that it was meant to be used. Uh, so my question is not, um, not understanding like most of what you're presenting, just <laughs> skimming the surface. <laughs> what would happen if, um, how would it be if you split that 900000 that you're asking to be put into capital reserve? Um, I totally understand that that um, makes sense to put money in there. But what happens if you split that money and return some to the, um, to the taxpayers and some to the capital reserve? I don't know how that would, if it would make much of a difference or... Yeah. So at our, at our current budget level, you can kind of think of $100,000 as about a penny for our tax rate. Mm -hmm. So if you took 400000 or 450000 and basically what we'd be doing is just 
using that to lower the tax rate. It would lower the tax rate this year by four and a half cents. Um, and then we'd have four hundred fifty thousand dollars going into the capital reserve fund, um, and that's certainly something we can do. Um, you know, if that's something that if the taxpayers really want to do that at the annual meeting, we can amend it on a floor vote, and we can amend the budget amount and amend the um, amount that's going into the capital reserve funds. But you know, at the same time, you know, we we have. Uh, purpose for that money kind of at this point. So, you know, if we did that in the fall, we'd wind up with a $450,000 larger bond that we're asking for. And so that would basically be taking that money and spreading it out over future years. Um, and, you know, whether which approach is kind of better is you know, a judgment call. So, can I add to that? Yeah. So, and also if you use surplus as offsetting revenue and you do not have that kind of surplus in the next fiscal year you automatically need to take four hundred and fifty thousand off of your offsetting revenue which will then increase the tax rate in the following year okay that's helpful to understand it absolutely um i wanted to go back to um what bob was talking about with the people that were not able to pay their taxes um just yesterday, I was talking with a woman in Bethel, um, an older woman, who had never done the homestead declaration and didn't understand how that all works. And so I'm going to, I printed out the stuff for her today and we're going to meet on Friday and I'm going to help her fill that out. I'm wondering if maybe you've got some people in Royalton that haven't taken advantage of that. I don't know. Uh, do you know if anybody's offering? The that town treasurer, uh, the tax, person, the tax, the tax collector. Yeah. Okay. Supposed to be yeah, but there are people in Royalton who haven't done it either. Yeah, because I mean, it's it, that makes a big difference. I'm <laughs> um, sure it does. Yeah. But, but that's not saying that it's, you know, that there isn't three hundred eleven thousand dollars worth of taxes that haven't been paid. Yeah. <laughs> whether they fill that out or whether they don't, I mean. But I at least it would reduce their them. burden for this year. You can't make them, and you know, hopefully somebody can explain to them what it does. But um, you know, we have, I haven't seen that kind of a figure, yeah, in all the time I've lived here. So that tells me, if you're looking at that figure, that there's a lot of people in trouble. I and they're rightfully so, you know. I don't know about again Royalton, but I do know that in when I was living in a previous town before I moved to Bethel, there were some people that purposely wanted to get on that list as a kind of a protest thing. And then they go in and, and pay their taxes afterwards. It was kind of a political thing that they did. And they were usually people that were kind of wealthy. And uh, it was just, they, they wanted that figure to be in there. So I don't know if anybody in Royalton does that, but Woodstock, they did. <laughs> And I'll, I'll just throw it out there just for being on the board in Bethel that we haven't seen any significant change in delinquent taxes in Bethel um, or water and sewer uh, year over year. So now ours, ours typically does float in the two or three hundred thousand dollars a year that we're constantly trying to to keep up with. But I don't think we've I don't think I've ever seen it below a hundred thousand. So it's uh, ours is usually twenty to thirty thousand. When I looked at that figure, it's just it's shocking. Um, Jamie explained that no money exchanges hands for the Winooski Valley. Winooski Valley School Choice. Yes. Okay. Uh, it's just the way that it was written. Um, like you, the districts set a cap on how many they're willing to let go out and how many they're willing to let come in. So they wind up being relatively even usually. I mean, at this point, I think we have three out and how many were in this year? More in than now. Yeah, it's more in than out, but. So Royalton could choose to go to Randolph and it wouldn't cost us. No. Well, there's a limit of kids, they apply and it's a lottery. So you can't, it's not guaranteed. So if there's already a line up ahead of you, you it's just only so many spots. 
you know, with tuition students, you know, the sending town winds up sending the tuition amount to our district. With this Winooski Valley School Choice, it's between towns that don't have school choice and it just, the first the student can attend, but it doesn't shift uh, people count or any money. So, but, you know, like if we have capacity, we appreciate having students come in and kind of contribute what they contribute to the school life of the school and the sports teams and the arts department and whatever else. So, so yeah. it really comes up to kind of a lot. Yeah. You know, unless unless we are over have classes that have too many students in them and stuff. And so adding a student would be a burden, like having somebody come in isn't a bad thing. And it's a good sign for our school that students are choosing this. You know, we really appreciate that we have more students coming into our school because it's a, you know telling us that we're doing things right and that it's an appealing place to come. So, thank you. Yes, I read in the paper that we're number two in cost per student. New York is number one on funding. Are we shooting for number one? <laughs> Just for modern total. Yeah. And we're number 26, I think it is, on our education standard. My son lives in Lebanon, Tennessee. He's got a $350,000 house. His taxes are $1,300. He's got four acres, uh, six acres up behind me, and his taxes are $1,500 on that on raw land. And we wonder why our kids are leaving town. My next question, what happens by 2030? The state of Vermont wants to own or control 30% of the land. By 2050, 50% of the land. Who is going to pay the taxes? Question. Um, I mean, I think that these are questions statewide, um, and I'm not sure I have much insight on them. Um, you know, like we. Definitely. We look at our budget and, and do the best we can here locally to provide the education that we feel our students need while also taking into consideration. You know, but we're 26 on our, on our scholastic record and we're number two on cost per student. This equation doesn't equate to me. I mean, I think Is that there's a, money into it. That's not the answer, apparently. Well, I mean, I think that when you are a low population state like Vermont, you know, there's, there are a lot of challenges to rural education. And that's a lot of what the state has. And um, yeah, I'm not sure I have a lot of, you know, insight globally or to how our state compares to other states and everything, but I, I can't hear what you're saying. Yeah, sorry. I don't, I don't know that I have a good answer for you. You know, again, we do the best with what we see in our budget, um, but I can't. Well, somebody speak. better be thinking about it because 2030 isn't very far away. And, and these are all great questions that you should you should call up when you get home your representative that serves your area. <laughs> Give me a break. Or you should you should talk to your state senators. I mean, you have three. Those are the people that are making these decisions, not us. And as you see, I mean, 80 percent of our budget is already fixed by those people. So. We're, we're not driving the bus, we're kind of riding shotgun, you know. And the, the other part to keep in mind is that the board really is trying to do what's best for our kids so that we can exceed the state average and do our part to make sure our kids are doing the best that they can. And the recent testing, Jeff, what was the proficiency of our kids? <clears throat> well, you know, the BCAP was new this year, and so the, the, the Record wasn't really accurate, I think, Bob. So I think we'll get a better understanding this year when we take the test. When we're preparing that, we just met today with our staff to prepare for that in March. In the elementary, we exceeded the state expectation. So the test results have just came out. How did we fare? The report will be at the board, next board meeting. We haven't reviewed it yet. Yeah. I'm sorry, I didn't hear you. The, the report will come out at the next board meeting. We haven't reviewed it yet because it just they just came out. Oh, just looked at it. Yeah. <laughs> Give me the <laughs> top dog. <laughs> we did look at the recent, very recently released BT cap data in our data team today in the middle school. 
And one thing that was very obvious is trying to compare VT cap data to what we've taken in the past as the norm to test the SBAC. They don't line up exactly. So finding an interpretation takes a little bit of digging. In other words, if you look at VT cap scores just on the surface, you would see a much, much higher percentage of middle school students, according to that test, were reaching proficiency. There is a very glaring difference, however, when you try to compare the two years. So we've had two days to dig into what was recently released. Um, we're not putting you off by saying we will have that prepared for the next board meeting. We have to dig further down than the simply beautiful graphs we were presented by the state. We need to ask questions such as where are we seeing specific student growth? How is student A measuring against themselves over time? Because we're looking at not necessarily apples and oranges, but kumquat and uh, cantaloupe. Um, they seem very different. So it's going to take a little bit of time. I'd, I'd, I'd like to look at those scores. I bet I can help you. <laughs> I think. A lot of brain games involved in looking at this to make sense of a state more of a task is a good thing. Um, I'm sure you've heard the many expressions about how numbers can be used. Um, we're trying to make sure that what we present to the public is an accurate representation of the growth that our students are making. And that's not the company line. That's what we try to do every time we have these sets of state data that are now more than a year old and we're looking at a cohort that has already advanced more than a year and i'm not sure what mechanism we have for inviting that kind of input i'm curious about that myself um we did receive a uh, kind of winter data report um at the last board meeting um so you know you can look at those if you want you can look in the website to get the um reports from the last board meeting and it has um this is our internal testing the uh the track, my progress. track my progress mm -hmm. testing it's for um you know the middle school and elementary school and then there's a, a new test for the high school that we're using so yeah. it has those results and i i will say looking at those we are trending in the right direction i don't think we're where we want to be exactly but we're seeing positive trends and that's what we're looking for is you know, continuous improvement, that's the, the goal. Um, are there any more questions? Anybody online have a question? Uh, yes. What happens if they vote it down? What would be the next move? Um, if the budget is voted down, then we would need to go back to the drawing board and come up with a new budget. Um, one of the benefits of voting in March is that, you know, we don't have to have budgets approved until, um, you know, June. So we'd have time to do a warning and revise the budget and come back with a, another proposal for people to vote on at a new uh, meeting. What could be the alternative? I mean, I mean, how much could you cut the thing if you had to? Uh, I couldn't give you an exact all number. Cadillac. We can't always have. Right, sure. I mean, I, I can't give you an exact number. I mean, we did add some positions, so certainly we could take those positions back out. Um, but I mean, I, I don't think I could give you an exact number. I mean, you can cut down to bare bones if you want, but I don't I mean, think that's you a good cut idea. It in half? No. no. Absolutely not. You know, it's eighty percent of it is staff salaries, and you know, it, you need to have a certain number of teachers in order to teach certain number of kids. Certain number of kids. And so, what's the know, student teacher ratio? Um, do you have? Those we try numbers? to keep within the education quality standard, so it depends on the age. So, kindergarten through second grade, they recommend to keep it um, between. I think it's. 17 and 20. Above third grade, you can go up to 25 in a class. Uh, in small towns like Vermont, where we have some funky cohorts of kids that the classes just tend to be either really large or really small. So we just do our best to try to keep them 
I would say around the 18 in the elementary 18 per class is the average. But you know that's classroom teachers. You know we then have support staff that supports those teachers, and you know like we can't completely get rid of guidance counselors and um, other staff like that. So you know I drive around some of these. Uh, just grade schools, and I see all the cars are parked in the yard, and you think you're going to a college, and I don't think grade schools drive cars. No, but high schoolers park in our parking lots. <laughs> <laughs> you, they can't keep them in the right parking yeah. lot. High school is parking the staff park. They're lazy and walk around. <laughs> uh, go ahead, Jamie. Um, I just wanted folks to know that also if folks folks want to dig into this budget deeper and look at, you know, line items that folks have questions about um, our population trends over the last few years, I'm more than happy to schedule a time to sit down with anybody individually to do so. Um, what I what I want the public to know, too, is, is that we have a district that is now becoming a place where folks want to come. Um, we're estimating that Rochester is going to send 80% of their sixth graders over to our middle school next year. That's increased revenue for your district and money that's staying within the supervisory union and not leaving like we've seen in the past. So what I would say to folks is I hear that it's challenging uh, times right now. I also want folks to know that one of the things in Vermont we have is a statewide ed fund. So what is spent up at U32 in East Montpelier, everyone is also paying for. And, and what contributes to that is that yield figure that you saw earlier tonight. And so when ed spending across the state is higher, that yield number drops. And we showed you based on ed spending across the state, it could fluctuate eight cents on your tax rate. Eight cents for you to make a difference is $800,000. So I just want folks to remember that yes, we could cut and we we could decrease the growth of our district and not be a destination district in school, but just know what we do locally, what happens statewide often contributes increases to your taxes much more often than what local spending actually does. So if you look at these yield changes from January to February, they're projecting spending across the state's going to go down. That results in an eight cent reduction for you locally. For us to have made that change, we would have had to cut $800,000 out of the budget. So just remember that the, the, that the Ed Fund is absolutely statewide and what's spent in Killington or Rutland or Burlington or Montpelier, you also help pay for. Thank you. When did, how long has this report been out? This one? Yeah. Um, I think I received mine in the mail three or four weeks ago. Yeah. How many? Three or four weeks ago? I'm not exactly sure. My wife had to go get one at the, the post office day out of the rubbish. We didn't get one. I mean, we try and we get the voters list from your town clerks. We get the voter list from the town clerk. So whatever your address is and whatever your voter registry is at your town clerk is what we're given to mail these mailers from. I've been here 50 years. Yeah, you ought right. to have my name. That's I know. What, what's, what's your name? What? What's your name? Kenyon. Kenyon? Yeah. I'm going to look and see if they're on my list. It should be. Mm -hmm. If it isn't, there's you, something you're I don't know. You're my taxes. You're <laughs> <laughs> we can, uh, we can cancel that. they come that. on time, the taxes, do I get those? <laughs> That's not a problem. <laughs> I have a question about um, the administrative assistant to the guidance. Is that a, a second administrative assistant person, or did you guys get rid of one in the last, I don't know, eight years? Yeah, I think they got rid of one a few years ago. Because there was one here. Yeah, originally. And I think we suffered since. Uh, okay. We haven't really done a great job, and there's so many needs in that department. Yeah. 
that this person could fill. Oh yeah, no. Yeah. That's... And you know, and we're increasing our size wise in right. the student population, so yeah. I think that's it. I don't know how you could do without one. Uh, yeah, uh, yeah. Well, we haven't done a good job, I don't think. Okay. Or, yeah. Just curious. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Is that rain? Yeah. It's pouring out there all of a sudden. You are on my list. I'm on everybody's list. <laughs> Both of your names are on the list from the town clerk, so I do not know why you didn't get one. It, it went out to all households on the voters list. Well, you might have the box at the post office. TV. Because we get our mail three, four times a day. <laughs> <laughs> so I do promise you were on the list. Okay. Thank you. Um, are there any other questions or comments people want to make? Is there one other comment on here that came up from somebody? Um, yes, we. that would, so this is Jude Arbioso saying, if you put off building improvements and don't keep the surplus, you would only increase budget about 3%. Um, <laughs> that is true that if you take the nine hundred thousand dollars and put it directly into the budget then it wouldn't increase the budget as much but the problem is that then the next year you wind up with that basically you're wind up with a nine hundred thousand dollar budget increase because you don't have a way of doing that multiple years in a row so if it, it would help just with this one time of decreasing taxes but then we wind up seeing the taxes go right back up um, and you know our judgment call is that these building improvements are important and that's why we are asking people to to put that money towards these building improvements so you know if if the voters have a different opinion then you know that's we can so what, talk about that at the annual meeting what's happening with the rochester school uh i will defer to jamie on that because that is the Rochester district. All right. Was the question about the high school? Yeah. So we, well, the Rochester district is part of Rochester Stockbridge. So White River Unified District doesn't have access to that. And mm -hmm. Rochester, Rochester pays tuition to White River Unified District when their kids come. And at the at a 19,900. So if that original merger had happened, probably we could be looking to access that high school building. But right now, Rochester Stockbridge is actually looking to sell that building to the town for a dollar in Rochester. And the town's looking to uh, building build some more community center type opportunities in that valley. And we expect that that vote's gonna happen sometime. Um, prior to June of this spring. So um, that that's where Rochester is going with that high school building. The actual school district would be selling it to the town of Rochester. And just to clarify, the uh, performance art space is primarily for practice spaces for the um, band and chorus programs. So, you know, even if there is a nice auditorium in Rochester, which as Jamie said, we don't have access to, if we did have access to it, um, it still wouldn't be appropriate for daily practice and um, needs. So that's what this one is looking at. In addition to the other, other improvements that are renovations that need to happen. Oh, and I, and I should have added, just so folks know, the, the actual district the Rochester Stockbridge District had committed not to access that building since um, 2021. So we've had no educational programming in that high school since then. Um, we've essentially mothballed it and turned the heat down as much as we can um, to try to save costs for that district. And that's why we're looking to sell it to the town of Rochester. there be any plans um, on Monday night uh, of, of the proposed new building, um, the music piece? Yes, I think there will be more information about that. Okay. Hopefully that night, um, okay. we need to get that organized, but yes. Um, I would also like to say that there is going to be a dinner before the annual meeting in Bethel. So 
hope people show up early so that you can come and enjoy a dinner and meet your neighbors and um and there's also child care provided so if anybody needs child care it's available and we hope as many people can come out in person as as are able to that meeting um a little off the subject but where where is the uh, free lunch for all students issue at Right now is Jamie. <clears throat> the state. I couldn't hear. I couldn't hear what that question was. I'm sorry. Could someone just repeat it? Free lunch for all students. Where Universal the, meals. Universal yeah. meals, Jamie. Oh, thanks. So, um, the state of Vermont, um, they passed a law last year to provide universal meals, and that will be in effect unless that law is changed. Um, and so what pays for that is money out of the ed fund. Um, the estimate is it's costing the state about 40 million a year, but universal meals will remain in place unless the legislature changes that law, changes that law. But that was enacted last year. And just to remind folks, the way we pay for that is out of the ed fund, and the way they generate taxes of that by that is by lowering the yield. So that that's one of the things that contributed to a lower yield this year. So that does bring up like schools are asked to be do a lot more than they used to, you know, like providing meals, breakfast, lunch um, for all students when they come in the door, um, and a lot of the uh, social supports and other other services that you know schools weren't asked to do in the past and you know whether that's appropriate or not is kind of a broader discussion but it's i think important to acknowledge that it's not you know it's schools are no longer just the classroom and that's it um, so Are there any other questions or comments? No. Well, uh, I'd like to thank everybody for coming out. Really appreciate you guys coming out to uh, learn about the budget and provide your feedback. Um, and thank you for your work. Thank you so much for coming. All right, thanks everybody.